In my last Asian Oddities video, I mentioned a movie called Vital that Shinya Tsukamoto starred in and Tadanobo fuck. I mentioned a movie called Vital that Shinya Tsukamoto directed and Tadanobo Asano starred in. My original plan was to cover that movie next. However, there's not much to talk about. Vital isn't bad. It was actually pretty good. But it's an art house movie through and through. While this is to be expected with a Shinya Tsukamoto movie, because come on, he's been, this has basically been his fucking career ever since Tetsuo, it doesn't always make for an interesting video. So I'll quickly sum up what I would have said about Vital. Interesting ideas, but confusing editing. Asano's character begins a relationship with his living girlfriend completely off screen and she is only relevant for about 10 minutes of the movie anyways. The stuff that really worked for me was everything with Asano's dead girlfriend, which thankfully was the majority of the movie. I went in thinking that this would be a love triangle with a corpse, but it turns out to be a much more sentimental story about a man not just learning to move on from the dead, but also his whole past life as well. And beyond that, I just don't have much to say about it. I'd give it a recommendation, but there's not a shred of camp in this movie. It takes its bizarre premise completely seriously. That could turn off a lot of people, it could also bore a lot of people too. But if this sounds in any way interesting to you, maybe give it a, you know, I don't know, check it out, maybe. See, my answer's so indecisive that I just couldn't make a video on it. So I searched out for another Tsukamoto film to watch. Completely ignoring a wonderful recommendation to watch Haze, I decided to watch Gemini so I could continue my theme of Tadnobo and Tsukamoto involving together. Of course, Gemini is already a huge divergence from Tsukamoto's norm in several ways. In 1999, Tsukamoto's films up until Gemini were always marked with an industrial setting. The scenery was very much a character in movies like Tetsuo or Bullet Ballot. Everything was always full of steel pipes and concrete walls. Being set in 1910, Gemini does not have that option, although Tsukamoto provides plenty of grungy sets where he can. This is the first real period piece from Tsukamoto, and there is a reason for that. Gemini is very loosely, extremely loosely, in premise only, basically, adapted from the Edegawa Rampo short story, Twins. The short story itself you can easily find in English, in a collection titled Japanese Tales of Mystery and Imagination. Edegawa Rampo himself is a very important figure, not just in Japanese fiction, but in mystery fiction as a genre. His stories, characters, and themes are still being used and reinvented to this day. Conan Edegawa, in case you couldn't tell, gets half of his namesake from this guy. The original short story is only about 20 pages. It's framed as a man's confession told from his first-person perspective about how he kills his twin brother and assumes his identity, even going as far to sleep with his brother's wife. Gemini takes that very basic premise and expands on it greatly. The core is still there, even with the cuckoldry, except now the brothers are separated by birth. There's class issues, and the wife is actually a character and not a paragraph. Edegawa's short story is hardly dated. The story doesn't really make any reference to the time period it was written in, and really, if you wanted to update it and keep it true to the source material, that would have been totally easy. But there's a clear intention on Tsukamoto's part to make this a period piece. While the time period is a nod to the era that Edegawa wrote in, Tsukamoto uses this setting to its fullest. Gemini is set just at the tail end of the Meiji era, which means that the Meiji Restoration was just coming to a close. Modernization was happening rapidly, especially among the upper class. However, much of the Edo period still exists, and you can see a very unique mixture. It's this mix between new and old that you don't quite get in other cultures around the same time period. And it's in the middle of this that we find our main character, Yukio. From his appearance alone, you can already tell that Yukio is the epitome 
of the modernized Japanese man. He's also a doctor, so he's naturally well off. He's also the son of a doctor, so he's even more well off with that nice little inheritance that he's getting. The story begins with the deaths of Yukio's parents at the hand of a very strange man who happens to look exactly like him. This is Tsutkichi, Yukio's identical twin. A distinctive scar sets them apart, which is also partially the reason why Tsutkichi is abandoned to the slums at birth. In Edogawa's short story, the mark was a mole on his thigh. Uh, in this, the mark has been greatly expanded to be this kind of ugly looking scar. While Yukio is a young, well-off doctor, Tsutkichi is a thief and murderer from the slums who dresses in rags. Their designs and costumes are totally different, as well as their social classes. Tsutkichi eventually takes over Yukio's life, forcing him to live in an empty well while Tsutkichi fucks Yukio's wife. Now if that ain't Dr. Seuss, I don't know what is. While the initial setup may seem like it isn't going anywhere, once the cast slims down to our core three characters, Yukio, Tsutkichi, and Yukio's wife, Rin, things really start to pick up. These three lead characters, portrayed by two lead actors, really make the film work. Masahiro Motoki is tasked with playing both Yukio and Tsutkichi, and he makes them very distinct. Even when the evil twin is pretending to be the good twin, you can still tell what character Masahiro is. Ryo plays Rin, and apparently the, neither of them just need a last name. They both go by one name. Ryo's like a model person. She's been in stuff, but nothing that I've seen. Ryo does a fine job with the character of Rin, but it is really no surprise that she is a solidly written character. Sukumoto probably doesn't get enough credit for it, but he's actually pretty good at writing women. He makes them people with flaws, without ever venturing into this realm of fuck all women. A good chunk of his female characters, like pretty much almost all of them, end up having some sort of affair but it never feels like the message is, all oh, women are whores. I never had someone go out with me, so now I make weird, bizarre art films about adultery. Or anything like that. It really says something when you can make a movie like Snake of June, which is basically an NTR doujinshi, and not come off as a misogynese. Now, getting back to Yukio, there is an excellent scene early on where he has the choice between saving a plague-ridden child from the slums or a wealthy noble. Literally, he has to choose between the two in a moment of life or death. Yukio chooses the latter, and later you get to see him making excuses for himself. This not only characterizes Yukio as someone that's willing to make excuses, that's willing to buy into this class system, but might regret doing so. But this also highlights the class divide that existed well into the Meiji era. As the evil twin returns from those same slums, the theme is carried over through the course of the film. On the same topic, the slums are the visual highlight of this movie. All the costumes and sets look so dirty and messy, but they're also so vibrant and colorful. It's this very strange mixture that I honestly wish we could have seen more of in the movie. Oh, and here's the part where Tadnobo Asano makes a cameo and he's dressed as this guy, he looks pretty cool. The other location that's worth mentioning and where a lot of this movie is set is inside of a well. About a quarter into this movie, Yukio is thrown and trapped into this well by Tsutkichi. The two communicate through this well, with the camera pointing up at Tsutkichi and down at Yukio most of the time. This setup only makes the divide between them all the more obvious. Tsutkichi is now on top, and visually Yukio is now down at the bottom. There's also this green glow at the bottom of the well. That's this excellent touch that really adds some color to these scenes. It makes the shadows even darker on Yukio's face. As Yukio spends more and more time in this well, 
he gets dirtier and dirtier to the point where he's just all he's he's just a dirt man by the end of this movie his twin is bringing him down to the same level making him all the more desperate for an escape one way or another and ultimately the conclusion is something that I'm not going to spoil in this video. Be aware that there's actually a lot of stuff that I didn't spoil in this video. However, Gemini is a bit thin. Sometimes it almost feels like an EC Comics adaptation because the premise is very simple and the social themes, while there, aren't really explored any further than the visual metaphors. But in any case, Gemini definitely gets a recommendation from me, a much stronger one than Vital. It's an interesting piece in Tsukamoto's filmography, just because of how different it is. Although even if you're not a fan of the director, there's still a lot to like in Gemini. If you're looking for a bit of a change up in setting from your typical Japanese horror, then give it a shot. I've heard people say it's not really scary, and that's true. It's not really a super scary movie, but the story unfolds in an interesting way. That's it for now. Uh, if you like this video, you might want to check out my other Asian oddities videos, as they also deal with weird and obscure Japanese movies. Last week's was Maribito starring Shinya Tsukamoto, uh, who as a change-up didn't star in Gemini. Funny about that. You can also check out my channel, which has more reviews for old as shit anime and a lot of stuff that nobody really cares about. But hey, as long as you guys are watching, that's fine. Next time, we will be seeing Tadanobu Usano again, this time in a little movie called Party 7.